Well, now as we officially begin, and hopefully all our participants are already on the line, and I want to again take a moment to welcome each and every one of you to our Pathways to Careers in NASA Science and Engineering. We are so happy to have all of you on the line. We're so excited to have our three speakers here with you, Maritza Montoya, Wilfredo Garcia Lopez, and Molly Bannon, who are going to share their pathways and their unique ways in which they got to where they are today. We do have registrants from 27 different states, Puerto Rico, India, France, and Spain. So welcome to all of you from all around the world, literally. And again, we're so thankful to our hosts, the SEAS program at UT Austin, Selena Miller and Margaret Baggio. We're thankful for them to enable us to be able to host and facilitate this event. So with that welcome, I am going to stop sharing and I'm gonna turn things over to our first speaker who is Maritza Montoya. So Maritza, over to you. Hi everyone, my name is Maritza Montoya and today I'm going to go ahead and talk to you guys about my pathway to NASA. I am a small particles processor and I do work with Jacobs. So a little bit about what I'm gonna talk about today, a little bit about myself, college universities I attended and obstacles that I faced along the way, experiences that helped me push forward despite of my obstacles and current, way, current work and some key takeaways. A little bit about myself. I am from Houston, Texas, and I am a first generation Mexican American. Both of my parents are from Mexico. The image on the left is me with my brother, my oldest brother, I am one out of four siblings. We are in Mexico there. I'm on a donkey and my grandpa has a farm. He has animals, chickens, everything to think of. And we would visit very often to Mexico. It was a every other weekend type of thing to visit grandma and grandpa. I loved animals and I, I'm smiling on the right on the first day of school picture. I loved nature. I knew that and I went to the schools near my area. So I went to Davila Elementary School, DD Middle School, Milby High School. These were all schools that were zoned to my area. It's Pecan Park area, just 10 minutes south of downtown. And these were the easiest schools for me to attend for my mom, who was a single mom working a lot of hours. And whatever was easiest for my mom, that's the school that I was going to attend. I was part of the magnet programs in middle school and high school, Milby High School had a science magnet program and there's where I had to double up on my math and science classes. I was really good at math and it wasn't until my senior year that I signed up for an environmental science class. And that's where I really found out my passion for earth science. I could read my ecology textbook for hours and not get bo bored. I did say to myself, I was gonna be an environmental engineer at that time and I wasn't really, I didn't really have good SAT scores. My GPA wasn't the highest. So my first way to college was through community college. I went there and I started taking my core classes and took requirements, transferred over to the University of Houston main, main campus. Again, I found myself uh, picking classes and I just happened to stumble upon geology. It was an elective requirement I had to, I had to satisfy. I loved geology, I loved studying it, and I just knew I wanted to know more about earth and its processes. But things didn't go so well at the University of Houston main campus for me. I did not pass classes like university physics and calculus too, which are classes required for a science major like geology. It was discouraging because I felt like I wasn't cut out for school. I didn't really connect with my peers. I felt alone and I kept my I kept to myself. I thought I was the only one struggling with passing difficult classes like those. I felt a lot of guilt because I felt like I let my parents down. I felt like I let my mom down because she came from another country and she worked so hard to give us a different life and and a better opportunity for an education. I would not 
when when I would take my exams uh, and I didn't pass them and I, I would go home and I'd cry instead of asking people for help. I should have asked my professors for help. I should have asked my TA for help. And I ended up developing testing anxiety, which would freeze me right before an exam. And I also left U of H because I didn't pass my classes. I went to Houston Community College and I got my associate's degree there. I made a rule for myself that I said, no matter how bad of a grade I was gonna get on that first quiz or whatever it was at that time in the exam, I was gonna keep going to the class. I was just gonna go sit there. <laughs> and I did, and that's when I started passing my classes. I did get my associate's degree in science at Houston Community College. So there wasn't like a major, it was just associate in science, which would help re, re, uh, fulfill the college requirements at the university level. I found another geology program and it was at UH main campus, uh, UH downtown campus, sorry. And that's where I qualified to start another geology program. And I continued to go to school and I graduated from UH downtown. I ended up getting back to UH main campus in grad school and that's where I am I'm on the works of getting a geology degree. I actually found the opportunity for the uh, for Jacobs, the job requisition. It was during my in the middle of my master's program and I applied and I just went ahead and jumped for the opportunity scared and I, I did get the job while I was and while I was still in grad school. A lot of the challenges and obstacles that I faced was that I was a first generation college student, so I didn't really know anybody that went to college in my family before me. And I didn't have the best GPA, it was not high. I didn't have the best SAT scores in the senior year. Everyone's like, okay, what, what GPA did you get? What, what, what SAT score did you get? Did you get it high? And, and that wasn't me. It was, it was a little bit discouraging. Another thing that I went through was that my family and the culture that I'm from, they wanted academic career that could be done quickly, like in two years. So four year degree, like a bachelor's degree was like, oh, are you sure you wanna do that? Like that's the questions that I would get asked. And I had to completely ignore <laughs> those comments because I knew what I wanted was gonna take a while. I knew that I, what I wanted was going to probably be more than a bachelor's degree. Mm, passing classes outside of my major was difficult. And the way that I challenged that was to go to tutorials. I went to workshops that helped with learning. I had to learn how to learn. I had to just learn how to be better at recall. And it, and it wasn't that I wasn't as smart as my colleagues. I just, I just needed a little bit more help. I did an, another obstacle challenge was that I got married and I had a baby. <laughs> I had um, three kids while doing my undergrad and and on the left on the right photo is me with my baby. I'm studying for an exam and I think it was a final. It was in 2015 and I I, ha I had a lot of support there. The the way that I overcame that obstacle was getting a lot of support. Like, even though I had my family, my husband, my house, my children, I had a big support network. I, my parents helped me a lot. My mom, my, my in-laws helped me a lot. And they were really there for me. You got to really surround yourself with people that are going to support you and your dream. And I also had to overcome my fear of failure and anxiety. And the way I tackled that the most, I think, was going to therapy. When you go to these universities or these colleges, they usually have a, a, almost a free program for you to go to seek counseling, to go see, to go seek help. Whether it is that you're, they have help for you whenever you're trying to overcome testing anxiety or failure or, or any type of anxiety, any type of mental health thing, they are there understand. for you. And things, experiences, experiences that helped me push forward through my academic career, despite these challenges, the things that really motivated me that I wanted geology more than ever was the field trips. That one of them was the field trips. We would be in a class 
and we would go on these field trips. We would go out into the field. We would find mountain areas to go observe and, and take notes of. And what we were doing is we were looking for minerals in the rocks. We were looking at how are these rocks forming or when did they form? Did they form millions of years ago or did they form thousands of years ago? And how did they form? Did they form from volcanoes or did they form from beach uh, sedimentary processes, right? And these are pictures of me with my, with my friends, with my classmates at that time. And I got involved in Geo Society. So clubs like Geo Society helped me pursue my degree even further. They exposed me to learn more about careers in geology because I didn't know what I could do with geology. I didn't know you could be, uh, you, I didn't know you can work for oil and gas industry. I didn't know you can work for the space industry. And you kind of learn those things when, when you surround yourself with that network. I talked to my professors a lot and I got involved in research opportunities anytime I could. And, and that was, that was something that helped me, helped motivate me. I joined study groups on the, on the bottom right photo is me and my friends at school. We're staying late. We are studying hard for our finals. We are passing together. And, and I don't think I, I would have, succeeded as much as I like I was not succeeding before by not connecting with my classmates by not cr creating study groups by not reaching out and asking other people to help you another thing that helped was finding mentors and here are some of the most influential people that were in my undergraduate degree they were my university professors they were all geology <laughs> Uh, doctorates, and they really helped me a lot. Uh, on the left is me graduating from my undergrad. There are my three professors in geology. They are the three ones that influenced me so much, told me about the careers they, they've taken, their pathways to uh, a successful geology degree. And on the right is my other colleagues, uh, one of them in the middle, she is my classmate. She is my lab partner. She is my, her name is Devin McQuaig, and she helped me so much get through my master's program. And beside her is Mnaka Ryder, and she taught me all the lab techniques that I know today. Like she told me how to be precise, and I just, I would listen to her, and she would tell me how to do things. Sometimes, I didn't like how it sounded. It didn't matter, but she taught me the most that I know. And I attribute a lot of my success to her. Current work that I do, I'm a small particles processor. I work in the lab. I, I transfer really small, tiny particles and it's called ultramicrotomy. I'm basically shaving really tiny sheets of a small particle. So when you hear shaving, the, the best way I can describe it is like when you're shaving a vegetable peeler, you're gonna peel a cucumber. And when you use the vegetable peeler and you're shaving it, it's like a thin slice of a vegetable. Well, this is kind of like that, but just at the very small scale, a small scale that you can't see with your bare eye. You need microscopes to see it. And the pictures here just show on the bottom left is me working with my hands to transfer a sample with a glass needle. In the middle image is the glass needle that I'm using to transfer that little tiny dot, which is a small particle. And on the right is me uh, lining up these small particles to practice moving them because a lot of times you can lose your particle due to static forces. And so I would pr I practice a lot to be careful to not lose my particles, and it's for other scientists to analyze them. And, and it's through something called transmission electron microscopy. Again, a little bit more on the ultramicrotomy that I'm doing. I am in a lab. I am working with things that are very small that you have to use a microscope to see them. 
And other work that I do is we're right now we're preparing for the OSIRIS-REx mission. And OSIRIS-REx stands for Origin Spectral Interpretation, Resource Identification, and Security Regolith Explorer. OSIRIS-REx is a mission that is coming, returning to Earth in September 2023, and it's bringing astro material from one of our near-Earth asteroids called Bendu. And part of my job is to learn how to disassemble and reassemble a TAGSAM. And that TAGSAM is at the tip of this. Uh, here you can see at the very end, I don't know if I can get a pointer here. I think I can. Here at the end, this is the TAGSAM. And that is a touch and go, this little thing here, is the touch and go sample acquisition mechanism. And what I work with at the Johnson Space Center is a replica of that. I take it apart, put it back together, and that is my work because the coming, the real one is coming in September and we have to be ready for it. I work with a lot of people on my team together, scientists and engineers. We prepare the tools for the mission return. So here you can see that I have a tool. It's, uh, it's almost like a screwdriver. On the right side is a tool that cannot go into our clean rooms. They are laboratories that cannot have contamination. And we need to find the right tools to use with our astral materials because we do not want to contaminate our samples. So that is what the left is showing. A clean room approved tool, it's the same one as this, but it's just, it can touch my astral materials. It is safe. <laughs> And again, I work with a team to outfit and prepare the laboratories for sample return. I take apart this TAGSAM. This is a TAGSAM. Again, it's what we saw in the previous photo. And specifically here, I'm holding some tweezers to take off these contact pads. And these contact pads are what made contact with the asteroid. And you can see that here. This is the same TAGSAM, but this is a real image of what the tags I'm touched on asteroid venue. And so here it's just me practicing again to pull it apart. I have to take these little things off and store them for scientists. And so here's me working with lab equipment. We're trying to see, is this the right height for, is this microscope the right height for looking at samples inside of a glove box? Here I am transferring particles, kind of like what I was doing in the previous slides. I'm using a glass needle and I'm moving it from point A to point B and I'm using these gloves and this is a, an environment where oxygen cannot come in and it's to keep our samples from being contaminated. Again, this is a tag stamp shown here. Inside, it's a little bit difficult to see, but there is some pretend sample in it. We call it simulant. And we are pretending, <laughs> rehearsing is more like it. We are rehearsing to open it and pour it out because we need to, we need to practice these movements because we're going to, again, open this exact same thing this September. Other work that I do is I work in a Stardust laboratory and I work with delicate aerogel. And this aerogel are these very, they're, it's like a very light blue cube and it traps small particles from the tail of a comet. It's called the Stardust mission and this occurred in 2006. I work with other people and I am here cutting the foil. I'm cutting um, to release this beautiful <laughs> aerogel. You have to cut it. Um, you have to release it from the cometary tray. And here you can see me taking the foils, storing them. And again, this is the aerogel that we are going to store. And it's for scientists to analyze and learn more about the origins of our space. Other work experiences that I um, happen or that I do or that I have been a part of is to visit JAXA. And JAXA, is a, it's basically the equivalent to NASA and it's Japan's NASA. It's Japanese Aerospace Exploration Agency. 
And one of my assignments is that I had to become familiar with the sample containers that hold, that hold another astro material. It's from asteroid Rugu. And this is something we have here at NASA. We have these same containers. Here I'm taking notes on how to open the container. I need, I need to know how to open these. I need to know how to get the particles out because we have these at NASA and we need to be practicing on how to open these. And they really, we, it's a collaborative effort, right? It's, it's, it's a collaborative effort between NASA and JAXA. JAXA brought Hayabusa too. They brought asteroid samples from asteroid Rugu and NASA is bringing back samples from asteroid Bennu. And I'm still doing research posters. I'm still doing research, things that I did in my undergrad. And my key takeaways are that I think that what helped me the most was join the clubs at school that are related to your interests, especially your career interests. For me, it was geology. I majored in geology, so I joined Geo Society. That was something that was part of my um, passion. I think it's very important to build relationships with your professors. Ask them about their experiences. How did they get to major in geology? What, where did they work at? Or whatever it is that, that you're interested in your major and you're getting a class by say a professor who's as a mechanical engineer, let's say that. Ask them, what, what did you do? What did you work? Where did you go? And, and it's really important, I think. Get involved in research opportunities. I, I think that's one of the main things that helped me in developing and succeeding in my academic career. Form study groups and remember that failures are temporary. They don't define, define who we are and failures do not define our potential. There is always a solution. You can get this, whatever it is that you want, the passion, the major that you want, you can get it. And that is what I'll end with. Thank you, back to you, Paige. So Wilfredo, over to you. Okay, well, my name is Wilfredo Garcia Lopez. I'm a geospatial scientist at NASA Johnson Space Center within Jacobs and Jets contract. And I'm going to talk about how was my career pathway to work at NASA. First of all, talk a little bit about my childhood and the time before college. There's a photo of me when I was little, little with a NASA rocket launch box. I'm from Puerto Rico, born and raised. Here's an astronaut photography of that beautiful Iceland in the Caribbean. In my childhood, I had many interests. I liked music, playing instruments. I liked and practice sports and everything related to camping and outdoors. From very young age, I like everything related to maps and was passionate about reading atlases, playing with Google Earth, drawing maps and playing with clubs. I began to be very interested in geography, planets, earth, also, also like social sciences, technology, computer sciences. So it was not clear or what awaited me in the future, but yes, I was always amazed of space and watching the, the territory from space. I was part of organizations as a child that made me grow and influence my interest, especially scouting that helped me a lot in growing as a person and acquiring basic oriented skills. And Starbase, that was a program for middle school about STEM fields, especially in space. Uh, that time I was very interested in computers, informatics mixed with earth systems. So a fun fact in that specific program, I remember that they had a big poster of the International Space Station mission contour. And I was amazed by that. I remember telling, telling my parents that I would love to work in a place like that one. Um, that interest about maps, outdoors and space could help me to give me an idea or hint in the future. Like all paths, it has not been straight, many curves, and I like to visualize it as a going up in a mountain. Sometimes you must go down, up, go down a bit, rest, take another way, but the goal should be always to be like reach the peak. I went to schools in my hometown, which is called Kamui. Actually, it's, it's in one of my biographies in high school, I put that I wanted to be a geographer or geoscientist at NASA. I kind of knew what I want, but I wasn't clear of how to do it. So other fun fact is that when I was deciding what to study, my mom was reading the newspapers and saw a promotion of a degree in geospatial sciences. 
and she told me like, look, take it. It's look like the things that you like. So in that moment, I had no idea of what was the meaning of the term or the terms that the promotion was mentioning. So I searched a lot of information in Google or internet about that. When I needed to decide the bachelor's degree, I didn't have a clear idea, even so I knew I was interested in some technologic field or science, something related to location, geographic information. So I decided to go to the University of Puerto Rico in Maya West to study topography. In that time, uh, I was not completely happy with that. And with the help of a professor and a physical geography class, I decided to take that step and change to what I really love, geography, and a curriculum more focused in the study of the territory. And um, yes, it's totally fine to change from major or campus and make decisions based on what do you think is the best for your career or, or life. One tool that was very important in that moment was YouTube. There's a lot of videos of careers from universities and departments and other, other ones that are very cool, like with names like a day in a life of an engineer or a day in a life of a scientist. Those can be very helpful. At the University of Puerto Rico in Rio Piedras, the campus where I finished the bachelor's degree, it's where I start to be a little clearer through the classes that I was taking and getting involved in research and opportunities. And it's when I decided that with the geography and earth sciences courses of the new major and the informatics, maths, and topography background, I was going to decide to apply for a master's degree in geomatics engineering and geoinformation in Universidad Politecnica in Valencia in Spain. At the end, it was good to combine that disciplines because they gave me like the opportunity to enter the graduate school that I applied to. But since the bachelor's degree, I was very interested in a NASA program called NASA Develop. It's an applied earth sciences temporary research program for students or recent graduates to work in NASA centers or research centers. The opportunity was not possible during college, but when I was in the graduate school, it was possible. I took the risky decision to stop the masters and go to NASA Langley Research Center in Virginia and participate in the program as a recent graduate. I don't regret that decision, of course, because it, it was my first experience working at NASA. Geomatics and geoinformation in my master's fields are related to data acquisition techniques, the development of digital mapping applications, geoportals, management of spatial databases, environmental and land use analysis and modeling with remote sensing, radar, positional te technologies such as GPS, navigation, um, surveying, documentation, visualization of geospatial or geographic data. It's, it, it's a field very related to geodesy, that is like the science of measuring and understanding the Earth geometric shape, the orientation in space of Earth and its gravity field. Then I finished my master's and I started working as a geographic information systems analyst for less research focused projects, but still very important for my professional development. Um, then I started applying for combat to work at NASA in this time at Johnson Space Center for Jacobs here in Houston. That is my, my current job. There were many challenges as always, natural events, hurricanes, pandemics, language, moving around to other places, etc but everything was part of a process from which I've taken advantage. Experiences or specific projects that have helped me forge my career, some of them are related to steps mentioned in the past slides. Uh, within my bachelor's in geography and later specializing in geomatics and geoinformation, I was very interested in the study of earth system through informatic models, digital cartography, or remote sensing from satellites. So I started to get more involved in studying natural events and disasters. That's why the research of, as part of the NASA developed program in NASA Langley, Virginia, was about flooding and inundations caused by extreme weather events. Um, also was part of the climatology laboratory from the University of Puerto Rico. When, where the main research was about the special variation on precipitation in Puerto Rico and US Virgin Islands, also extreme temperatures associated to climate change in, in those Caribbean islands. 
Then my master's research project, I studied the watersheds of El Yunque National Forest, developing a computer program based mainly in Python for calculation of hydrological models and studying climate changes in the area based on, on the results. In my years of college, I was part of a summer volunteer in Chile that also it was not a science research experience. It was a good opportunity for teach kids about earth and environment and be part of outreach opportunities of geographic topics and reforestation activities. In that time, I also searched for opportunities closely related to my field. So I applied for an internship in geographic information systems where I contributed to the creation of a digital atlas of, of, of my Iceland. As I said previously, I was a geographic information analyst. So I was in the same company that I did the GIS, the geographic information system internship. And I was part of many projects for private and public institutions developing scripts for automati automatization of geographic data management and digital cartography applications. So what do I do now? Well, I'm a geospatial scientist in the Earth Sciences and Remote Sensing Unit within Astromaterials Research and Exploration Science here in NASA Johnson Space Center. What's a geospatial scientist or what a geospatial scientist do? Well, we work with geographic information and spatial data for measure, observe, and do analysis of processes of the Earth. We work with the spatial analysis of human and physical variables we work with a lot of maps, a lot of maps, geographic information systems, satellite images and data and do the collection, distribution, analysis, storage, processing, um, and presentation of geographic data or geographic information. Here in NASA could be like from Earth, Moon or Moons or other planetary systems. Uh, here in the left, there's an astronaut photography from the International Space Station of Houston at night, which is one example of the type of images or data that we work in our unit. Most part of my work is with the crew air observations. We work with the crew members on the International Space Station that photograph the Earth using handheld cameras for record how the planet is changing over time, support studies of natural events such as hurricanes, floods, and volcanic eruptions. Um, also, our team monitor events supporting us uh, the International Disaster Chapter that is part of the USCS with air data from, from space. We support with imagery for, for them. Also, I'm a crew air observations payload operator, which means that there's times that I need to create daily messages to crew members in the uh, International Space Station describing the targets that they need cool photograph depending on the track of the ISS and other air conditions and variables. Also, we process your reference and share the imagery that the astronauts take, everything related to sites on air that they need to be studied. This work is very related to my college background, but it has the peculiarity and its unique task that is working with imagery from the ISS or astronaut photographies. It's clearly important to have like a good academic background in the field that you are deciding to dedicate, but also be open to learning new things throughout your professional career. Some challenges of my job as an entry level is to start working with software or data strictly related to NASA, a challenge in a good way because it always, and it allows you to learn an incredible amount of new tools and that's a good at the end. My job has a lot of enjoyable and rewarding things, but for me, the most special is to have the privilege of every day working with such amazing images of Earth from space, amazing views that the astronauts are seeing all the days up there. Also here in our team, we have a great variety of Earth scientists working together, geoscientists, engineers, geologists, geographers, climate experts, planetary scientists, data scientists, and more. A very fun part of working here in NASA. So thanks for listening and everyone that is deciding career pathway, choose remember that every path is unique and individual. Take tips and advice of other one, of course, but create your own path. 
And most all experiences are good. Take advantage of every opportunity that it appears to you, even if it seems that you will not use it in the future, probably you will learn something. Go and look for those opportunities and work hard to get them and when you get them. Believe in your potential to do things. If you have a passion for something, go for it. And the most important, enjoy the path. Enjoy every step in your career pathway and have fun. So I hope hearing about my career has been helpful to everyone listening and, and watching. So now I'm going to stop sharing my screen and probably turn things over to Molly or, yeah, Molly. Um, so I'm Molly Bannon. I work at NASA's Johnson Space Center and I'm on a temporary assignment right now as an innovation and strategy specialist. Um, but my regular job is being a concept engineering group lead in our engineering directorate, um, where we work on, you know, concepts and architectures and kind of thinking of like, hey, what's the future of our base camp on the moon look like and those kinds of things. Um, but on my temporary assignment, I'll get into that a little bit later in my presentation. So just a little bit about me. Um, I grew up in the Midwest in Iowa. And so the picture on the bottom right is the Field of Dreams, which is kind of one of the only things that people know about Iowa is that we have, we had that movie and that we have a lot of corn. Um, but growing up, um, I liked to travel. Um, I liked the outdoors. I attended a summer camp every year. And then eventually I worked at that summer camp. That's actually me and the blue polo on the top left. Um, some of my hobbies and things that I like to do, I like to do crafts and other kinds of things. Like I made a t-shirt quilt. Um, I enjoy animals. That's my fuzzy white dog. Um, and then I also like to travel. Um, I started traveling to Europe in high school. Um, I studied abroad in college and, um, that's actually me in Germany most recently this past fall. Um, my sister moved to Germany and so um, I went to visit her and uh, just, just really enjoy traveling. And so that's a little bit about me. Um, but one of the main things is, as I said, my sister about me is that I'm an identical twin. Um, and usually when people hear that, they think, oh, you know, like, you're so lucky. I wish I had a twin. Um, and for a long time, I was just kind of like, well, it's just like another sibling. It's no big deal. Um, and it wasn't really until I got into college and she and I kind of started going our separate ways that I realized that we really had this deep connection and relationship. We're kind of a dynamic duo, like I could rely on her for anything. And I kind of realized that like the importance of connection and relationships um, as you go throughout your life and your career. Um, and that's actually something that's really important to me now because of the close connection that I have with my sister is making making those connections, um, both at work at NASA, but then also like on the personal side. And so um, when you find things in your life that are like really important to you based on life situations, you know, experiences, um, think about those things and kind of how they've impacted your life and kind of what they mean to you personally and let that influence, you know, every day um, just in your career and things like that. And this, this is actually one of the reasons that I moved into this innovation and strategy specialist role um, temporarily where I actually get to, to make connections across the NASA center between all these diverse different groups doing different things. And I also get to think about um, partnerships and how we work with people outside of NASA and making some of those connections between, hey, this company is interested in developing this technology. And hey, I know these people over in this organization at NASA that are kind of working on something similar. And then I connect them and let them have a conversation about it. Um, and I also do some kind of teaming sessions where like I get people together to kind of brainstorm and think of new, unique new solutions and things kind of outside the box. And so um, I've let my life experiences kind of influence where I've driven myself in my career. And I find that, you know, when I've done that, I've been happiest. Um, when I've kind of ignored some of those things, that's when I've kind of felt a little bit um, out of place. And so that's a piece of advice I have for you. 
Um, but really, how did I become an engineer? Um, I put these two photos up because these are actually photos of my grandfather's. Um, that's my grandpa Dave on the left and I am the one in the orange shorts and striped shirt in the middle on the left. And then that's my grandpa Bill on the right and I'm the one in the, in the red shirt next to him. Um, and actually both of my grandfathers were civil engineers and growing up, I got to see them. I didn't really see them at work per se, but I always saw them at home, they would be fixing things around the house. They would be kind of doing things, solving problems. And to me, that's what an engineer did. They solved problems. Um, like one time my grandpa Dave, um, my sister and I had gone to some kind of circus or carnival or something. And we came home from there and we were just raving about the stilts and people walking on stilts. Well, the next day my grandpa Dave went out into the garage, got some scrap wood and built my sister and I some stilts just out of some scrap wood. And we were like running around, not running because we were new to stilts, but like walking around the driveway um, on our stilts. And I was like, this is what an engineer can do. Like basically you have a need, you have a problem and, and you go off and solve it. And so I always kind of saw that and I was interested in, in math and science from that perspective because I had these figures in my life that um, influenced me early. Um, but the thing that kind of, so kind of growing up, I knew, hey, like I like math and science. I liked other subjects as well. And in fact, at one point I thought I was gonna be a veterinarian because I really liked animals. Um, but then I had, I learned that you had to like cut into them and do operations and um, maybe even euthanize them. And I said, ooh, that is not for me. Um, so I explored, started exploring other things. And, you know, when my grandpa's in engineering, I thought, hey, maybe this is, maybe this is where I should go um, with my career path. And I remember like growing up, um, you know, like if you stick your hand out a car window and that's why I have this picture um, and you kind of like tilt it up or down and the air will force your hand up or down. I always thought that was really cool. Like this invisible thing was forcing my hand up and down. And I just, always thought that was really cool. And I would commonly do that when my parents were driving us around is just stick my hand out the window and let it kind of just snake up and down from the airflow exerting um, forces on it. And so when I was looking at all the different engineering fields and I have these kind of experiences and I was like, well, you know, aerospace engineering deals with wind and airflow. And so um, why not? I'll try that. And it really was more kind of a, me just kind of trying it out and seeing if it, excuse me, was a good fit and um, not being really 100% sure though. But um, so I entered my freshman year in college, um, going to Iowa State University, which was fairly close to home for me. Um, I chose that because um, I got the best scholarship. Um, and with my mom being a single mom, raising three kids, you know, money was an issue for us. And so um, that did kind of influence my decision, but it was a really good state school. Um, and so I went there for aerospace engineering. And some of my experiences being an engineer in college in aerospace engineering, um, they actually made us take two flight lessons, which was really cool. And so I got to fly a plane. Um, I will never become a pilot because I actually get a little motion sick in planes that small, but um, I enjoyed it just kind of <laughs> getting to see kind of like the user experience from the things that we're kind of learning to design in school. And so whatever your, your field is, no matter what you go into, I think that's really important, like whether you're designing software or, you know, um, designing some kind of, you know, household gadget or maybe a car, whatever you're doing, um, if you're kind of maybe making a web portal, like it's important to think about what the customer or the user experience is. And they gave us that in college. And so that was really impactful. Um, but a lot of engineering actually is working in teams. And so we did a lot of that throughout school. And this on the bottom left is by um, senior design team and me, I'm on the far left, the only girl on my team. Um, in engineering, there do seem to be fewer females, although that's changing. Um, but it never really bothered me that much because there were always like some of us and it almost always created kind of like a bonding experience between those of us that were 
in that field. Um, but during college, um, I went to a career fair and uh, there was just all these different booths of all these different um, companies looking to hire. And I wandered around and um, I saw NASA had a booth there. And I don't think they really do that anymore. I think it's mostly all online nowadays. But um, I thought, oh, that's so cool. Like NASA would be awesome. Um, I would probably never get a job there, but I still want to go talk to them anyway. Like I'm probably not smart enough um, or good enough or like have enough experience um, to like basically get me a job there. But I did um, go ahead and give them my resume and they called me back for an interview. And so I got an interview and to be honest, I thought I bombed <laughs> the interview. There was one question where basically I couldn't, it was like my first time interviewing for anything super important. And even though I prepared, um, there were still questions that caught me off guard. Um, and I'd been in interview for jobs in, in high school and stuff, but this was like my first real interview for something that was super important to me. And um, I, he asked some question and I didn't even come up with an answer. I, I kind of just like, was like, um, well, I think I might something, something if I was put in that situation. Uh, but I'm not really sure. Like I completely bombed that question. I thought I bombed the interview. I thought there's no way they're going to give me a job there. It was kind of a pipe dream anyway. I thought it was way far out there for me. Um, but lo and behold, um, I guess enough of my other experiences um, and being a good communicator kind of mattered enough that they offered me an internship. And so I got an internship here at the Johnson Space Center. Um, and that's actually one of my mentors here on the top right. And we're standing behind a wind tunnel model. Um, and so I progressed with my internships. I had multiple ones throughout college here at NASA's Johnson Space Center. And when I graduated um, undergraduate, um, they offered me a job. So I moved to Houston from Iowa. It was about a thousand miles away um, and took the job. And so, so far, some of the highlights of my career um, have really been uh, the kind of big momentous missions um, that we've had. But I did start off my career in what we call aerothermodynamics, which is basically the heating to a space vehicle from going super duper fast through the atmosphere. Um, I think most people have heard of shock waves um, and the fact that once you're going faster than the speed of sound, you generate this shock wave. Um, well, once you get going really, really fast, that shock wave gets um, really, really hot. And so you end up having a lot of convective heat transfer and then eventually even radiative heat transfer from the shock wave itself to the vehicle behind it. And so the group that I worked with, we tried to predict those temperatures and the heat transfer um, to our space vehicles, um, basically to protect the crew. And so this happens both on ascent or launch, um, but then also re-entry from outer space back down to earth. And so we worked on, on both pieces. Um, but one of the highlights of my career is actually this photo here. Um, in the background there is a rocket, a Delta IV Heavy, and it actually launched a space capsule Orion on top of it. And I had worked on the heat shield design for that space capsule. And so this was like kind of the first mission where I had worked on something that actually went into space and, and came back successfully. And it was really, really exciting. Um, some of the other highlights in my career, um, when I first started, we were still doing the space shuttle. And so I did get to do a little bit of work on that um, and actually go inside of a space shuttle. In the bottom middle picture, that is a real space shuttle that went into space. I'm not touching it. I just look like I'm touching it, like by reaching out my hand. Um, but kind of what I do, I do now, um, I worked on the Artemis 1 mission, which you may have just heard of, launched and um, went around the moon and then came back successfully. And on the right, that's me in front of the Artemis 1 um, rocket with the vehicle on the top. Um, in the little white part is where the spaceship is. Um, so I worked on that. And then nowadays I work on more concept engineering, which is really kind of thinking about like, what are these future space missions and um, 
space habitats and things that we're going to do on the moon and Mars, what do these things look like? And so this is actually a picture of me in our um, one of our what we call Mars analogs, where it's we're going to put a crew in here. And this is kind of the outdoor space that's supposed to look like the Mars surface, where they're going to go do some mimicked activities. And so this is kind of looking at kind of how the crew behaves, um, how they like their food, um, all these kinds of things, because those kind of psychological impacts are really important. And we need to kind of predict them for these really long duration missions, because um, the moon's really close and we can do missions there, you know, on the order of, you know, a handful of days to a couple of weeks. Um, but for Mars, um, we're looking at, you know, months long journeys just to get there. And so we need to kind of be looking at these things. And that's some of what I'm on now. Thank you to all of our speakers. And for those of you that remained on the line with us, we know we had a little bit of technical difficulty there, but I think the fact that we were able to have all of you hear these stories of having a family and a career, traveling, going to different universities, building relationships, working with astromaterial samples, working on Artemis, future missions, working with astronauts and imagery of space, the diversity of what our folks uh, chatted about today just sort of sends that message to hopefully all of you that like Wilfredo mentioned, that mountain that you constantly go up and maybe down and then back up, um, those different opportunities and sometimes those failures that go along with them they only help you perhaps pursue uh, or find a way to pursue how you can have and achieve success in your future careers. Um, now, as we are 15 minutes past the top of the hour and we are sort of in the sense um, at the end of our time together, I don't know if we have time for a Q and A, but what I will say, I can't stress how thankful I am to Maritza, to Wilfredo, and to Molly for sharing what it was like for them. And I hope that you all resonated with some of the stories that they had to say, because I'm betting some of you have perhaps experienced some of those same things. And from these three folks that have been sharing with us tonight, um, you can do anything you put your mind to. And so thank you, um, Maritza, Molly, and Wilfredo. And before we stop, I'm just going to give you like 30 seconds to each of you if there's any closing remark you want to say to the folks on the line. And I'm going to start with Maritza, since you just finished 30 seconds or less. Any last comments for our folks on the line? Yeah, I I just believe that you guys should go for it all, whatever it is that your dream is, and don't don't hold back and pursue it with all you got. That's really important. Great advice. Thank you. How about we'll go to you next, Wilfredo? Any last comments for our folks on the line? Yeah, following the words of Maritza, follow your dreams. If you have a passion to do something, like you can do it. Believe in yourself and hard work. Learn if you more you learn more, it's better for you and your future. So believe yourself and hard work. That's it. And have fun. Great advice. And Molly, how about you? Any last words of uh, wisdom for the folks on the line? Yeah, I'll just add that kind of like Wilfredo was saying, you know, sometimes your career is this winding path, and sometimes you even have like offshoots that don't go anywhere and, and you end up kind of retracing your path. Like um, I actually got a master's degree while I was working um, and I don't even use it for my regular job. Like I, I started down that master's and then um, I finished it. But in the middle of that, I kind of was like, hey, this isn't really where I want to take my career long term. I kind of want to go over here. And so when those things like that happen in your life, don't look at them as a waste. Don't look at them as a failure. It's a learning experience and it actually adds to your overall perspective. Um, and now you know something that you don't necessarily want to do. And so, um, you know, there aren't, they all aren't failures. They're all learning experiences and just enjoy the journey and um, don't think of them that way. Just think of them as experiences and things that you can add to, to just stories and everything that you interact with people around. And 
That's absolutely terrific advice because everything that you all do, there's something you can learn from it and you can apply it, that knowledge to whatever it is that you may, you know, want to do in your future or not do in your future, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm so glad we took that extra 30 seconds or so for each person to, um, to give those closing remarks. And um, we appreciate, again, Molly, Maritza, and Wilfredo. We very much appreciate all of you that have joined us, whether you're on this event live or whether you're listening to the recording. Thank you so much. We also appreciate Rosina and, and Suzanne who have been working the background to make sure things are going smoothly. We thank them as well. And also Selena and Margaret from the C's UT um, Austin program. Um, we are so thankful for you to give us the opportunity to share our folks with um, people that will likely be NASA's next generation of scientists, engineers, and explorers. So thank you all so very much for participating. We'll see you.